Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out to the Mercatus Center uh, Lunch CHC course. I'm Aaron Merrill, as always. Uh, the Mercatus Center is dedicated to putting academic ideas into actionable policy goals. And instead of a long introduction today, I'll just get right to the meat of the matter. Jason Fickner with the second part um, of the federal budget primer. This part is called Fixing the Federal Budget. You have two sets of slides in front of you. The last uh, slideshow from a couple weeks ago, for those of you who missed it or didn't get a copy of it, um, and also the survey forms we always have. If you could hand those back to me or to Megan at the end of the day, that would be greatly appreciated. So without further ado, Dr. Jason Fickner. Thanks, Aaron. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for coming out. I know all of you are concerned about the upcoming snowpocalypse, whatever they're going to call it today. So we'll, I promise not to keep you here till midnight. Um, for those of you that didn't see the lecture presentation two weeks ago, we do have it posted online. I know Hill staffers have nothing but free time on their hands. So when you're bored and want to watch it, you can look at it online. Um, but the presentation also, the PowerPoint's in front of you. Just a quick recap, what we did is go through some terminologies of the budget as well as the process the formulation of the budget, how it starts at the agency level, works its way through the White House and OMB, how it's passed through to the President's budget submission to the Hill, and how it works through, of course, for you guys with the congressional process and the timeline. So that's basically it, and of course, all the problems we have with various rules of pay-go, cut-go, uh, reconciliation, all that was covered uh, two weeks ago. So what we're going to do this week and today is go through and talk about sort of why are we here, how are we getting into this mess, what is this mess? and what possibly could we do to fix it. So here's why you're here. We have a gigantic deficit. No surprise. Now, unfortunately, the CBO came out this morning with updated numbers uh, as I was coming over here. So this presentation is slightly outdated. In fact, I'm a little bit more optimistic now. Um, these numbers are more optimistic, I should say, than the CBO's updated analysis. We have what shows here roughly a $1.3 trillion deficit. CBO is now estimating it'll be $1.5 trillion this year. Um, part of that basically is the extension of the Bush era tax cuts for two more years, uh, and the economy is still growing slowly. But this chart shows a lot of things I think it's worth pointing out to see where, we, where we've been and how we got here. We have in the sort of turquoise blue line outlays, and we have in the dark line revenues. We also show sort of the average since the post-World War II era. And what's interesting to note is revenues tend to hover around 18.2, 18.3%. We've also seen historically is that in periods where revenues seem to go higher, it corresponds with public cries for tax cuts. And when revenues seem to get low, there seems to be a lot of discussion about, well, taxes are too low, how do we increase it? But what's interesting is the economy seems to always try to trend around 18%. It seems to be what we basically have a feel for. It's just, it's just a correlation, not a, not a causation. But there seems to be this correlation that as a US society, we seem to be comfortable around the 18% level of GDP for taxes. So for outlays, how does that go? Well, we've been trending around 21%. And again, the same thing kind of happens. There are various spikes that happen because of recessionary periods. There are spikes for defense spending or something else. But there's basically a trend line to the average outlays around 21% of GDP. When you start getting high, you start seeing sort of retardation and reductions in growth levels. But this is sort of the trend line. So we start talking about the idea of budget reform and looking at putting our fiscal house in order. We can't keep this gap forever. You know, annual deficits add up to, of course, long-term debt. We need to do something to get these things more in line. Obviously, either you raise taxes or you lower spending or both. Of course, I have my own preference, but the choice is mathematically one or the other. So let's look quickly at sort of at federal revenues and how those have looked as a various component uh, throughout the years. So this is your total line we had earlier. And here's how it breaks out between individual social insurance or payroll taxes, corporate, or excise. And you can kind of see, again, the individual sort of as a trend. Payroll taxes have some sort of trending out, especially since 83, when we had the 83 reforms. Um, corporate taxes bounce around. Now, the thing with corporate taxes, um, with taxes in general, only people can pay taxes. This is one of those rules that don't seem to come out a lot in discussions. Think about the idea of a sales tax. When you go to the supermarket and you buy a candy bar for a dollar and there's a four cent tax, so it's 104, the uh, store actually remits the payment to the IRS, the four cents, but who pays it? You do. The consumer does. So in all sense, even like the estate tax, the estate tax can't be borne by dead people. 
It's borne by the heirs who are living. So with the corporate tax, it's the same way. The corporate tax isn't necessarily borne by the corporation. They might pay it, but it's passed on in one of three ways to living people. Either it goes on to consumers in the form of higher prices, it's passed on to employees in the form of lower wages, or it's passed on to the owners of capital, i.e. the shareholders, in a reduced return, like a reduced dividend or reduced capital gain, or a combination of the three. So looking at corporate taxes, what's happening is seeing a lot of income shifting. Corporations have been moving jobs and things other places for lower tax rates. So you're not really going to tax them. So the idea of trying to get corporations to pay their fair share just means someone wants to basically tax you more and it's shifting somewhere. So we, we're not doing tax reform today, but it's important to keep in mind again that tax is basically, you aren't taxing an entity. At the end of the day, you're always taxing a person. The point is to figure out where that incidence lies and who's being taxed. But it is interesting to see here, this is how we're looking at. So if we want to reform the system, there's various sort of levels we can do. And lately, a lot of people, because of the change in the income tax, have been paying more in payroll taxes than they have been in income taxes. This is sort of outlays and revenues. So this, again, sort of breaks up in revenues by a pie chart. Shows that roughly out of the $2.1 billion uh, trillion dollars we collect in revenues, and again, 3.5 in outlays being spent, there's your deficit. But roughly 43% uh, come from individual income taxes. Excise taxes are small, 3%. Corporate taxes are 7 And again, social insurance taxes, the payroll taxes, are 42%. So this sort of breaks it out for you. And then outlays, you can see, right now, Medicare and Medicaid are 19%. Social Security is 20 This is 40% of your budget right there. Add in other mandatory at 17%. <coughs> and other mandatory includes things like unemployment insurance. Now you've got 57% over half your budget is going for entitlements right off the bat. Interest, 5%. Now right now we have very low interest rates. That probably is not going to last for long. So where does this look by category? Again, here's non-defense, discretionary, other mandatory, defense, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. You can see that during times of, when we had the Cold War, times of war, we have an increase in the share going to defense. You can see sometimes when it comes down to non-defense, discretionary, other mandatory. But here's sort of the big story. The big three, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. They are the drivers of the budget problem we have. So last night, the President of the State of the Union talked about the idea of holding non-security discretionary funding for five years. That is roughly, I think, 12% of the budget would save $40 billion over 10 years. That is nothing when you think about the fact that we have a $1.5 trillion deficit now and a $14 trillion debt. It doesn't do anything. Somebody's got to tackle this one way or the other. Whether it's a reduction in benefits, whether it's reducing or slowing the growth of benefits, which means no one really sort of gets harmed, you can still do that and keep things in time with inflation, or raising taxes to cover it. At some point, we have to tackle this or it blows up. Um, this is discretionary and other mandatory outlays. Again, one of the interesting things to note when we talk about entitlements, there is the big three, Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, but there's also a spike we've seen lately in this powder blue line, which is other mandatory, excluding those big three. This is a spike in unemployment insurance. So again, because of the money we've been given to the states on unemployment insurance because of the recession, this has really spiked up as a share of mandatory <laughs> spending. Now, presumably, as the economy recovers, this will come back down. But it's important to note that this has spiked up, and this has been a big part of the budget deficit in the last year or two. Yes, sir? Does that include the extension? Yes. Yes, it does. Good question. This does include the extension. So again, to sort of point out in the same sort of graphic, but a little bit different, look how the other, again, the unemployment insurance, for example, sort of trends up. We have sort of mandatory other things that happen. But look at the big spike now. It's actually more than Social Security outlays were last year. So again, the forecast is that this will come back down and sort of go down to a normal trend line. But again, this is where entitlements in general, sort of these automatic payments we make because someone qualifies by law, has shot up. And generally, when you go through the budget process, what you're doing every year in the budget process is you're fighting over discretionary funding. So every year when we go through the 12 appropriations bills, all that stuff's basically discretionary. This stuff in some ways is on autopilot. Unless you actually change law to change eligibility, it goes on automatic pilot. So you're not budgeting for this. It's just happening and it's eating into everything else. So how does it look as far as a, a bar chart based on a percent of GDP? Again, this is where sort of you see, here's all your revenue. And again, revenue sort of hovers around the 18 to 
We're looking at 2010 then forecast for 2020, 2030, and 2040. So as a share, you see all other spending. You get your Medicare and Medicaid, Social Security. Now here's the thing here, net interest. So again, 2010, we're paying very low interest rates. At some point, that's going to end. The historical lows cannot stay historically low forever. They go back to a usual and average. So as a component of overall spending and mandatory spending, interest is going to increase, especially since we have so much debt being piled on right now. So we're going to start seeing more and more of our money, instead of 7%, probably anywhere from 11 to 12% going to interest, which again eats into the discretionary budgeting that we have authority here in Congress to oversee and budget every year. So this is a way of showing it in a bar chart. How does it look as a pie chart? So again, here we have what was 1970. All right, so 40 years ago, discretionary spending was 62%. Mandatory programs, 31. Net interest, 7. Where are we today? Almost flipped. Mandatory is 57%. Discretionary is 38. Net interest is 5. But where are we going? So an estimated $12.3 trillion in spending for 2040 would have mandatory programs being 47%, net interest now 35. <coughs> and what this basically means is because we keep spending more money every year than we take in, the annual deficits compile up to the annual debt, add to the debt, interest rates will increase, and all of a sudden, that balloons. But net interest and mandatory programs together are your entitlements and mandatory spending. You're now looking at, again, 82% of spending going for some sort of mandatory spending. Now, we talked two weeks ago about the idea of how can we have added problems passing budget bills, appropriations bills, how can we can't get a balance, um, the uh, budget resolution passed on time. So part of this, again, this is what you budget for basically every year. Now, now we're doing it for this. We're going towards this. Think about all the partisan bickering we had at 62% of the pie. Now we're having at 38. Imagine how bad it's going to be when we go to 18% of the pie. Everyone's pet projects, everyone's interests, everyone's wanting to, to basically appropriate and spend money on agriculture, defense, education, everything else. The pie that can go for that is now getting smaller because so much will be dedicated for mandatory spending that the fights over what's left, the fights over the left that can go for discretionary is going to intensify. And it's going to be harder and harder every year to actually pass a budget. And again, as we talked about two weeks ago, sort of the role of government if you can't pass a budget, you really can't govern. So to budget well means to govern well in some senses. We're going to be seeing issues, I think, year after year. Where we're going to see more things being kicked down the road, more omnibus bills, more minibus bills, more CRs, unless we can start today to get into uh, fiscal responsibility and turning the clock around and controlling our deficits. So this is sort of, again, showing where by GDP we're sort of headed. And again, I don't want to you know, gloss over this. The big ones, again, are Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. We've got to do something for it. Social Security, in some ways, you know, it levels out. You know, we know, basically, the population growth that's going to happen. We know people's ages. We can estimate their longevity. We know the payments coming in, what they should be going out actuarially. That's kind of predictable right now, even under current law. Medicare and Medicaid, health care costs keep rising faster than the rate of inflation. Utilization rates keep increasing. New technologies keep increasing that cost more that people demand, which is driving up, of course, health care costs overall. So this is all CBO numbers. They're still estimating that health care is going to go up to 18% of GDP at some point in time. The old joke is at some point, either we'll all be working for health care or on it. And you can see where we're starting to go with that trend. And this is even after the health care laws passed. <coughs> so health care is still increasing and taking up larger and larger share of our output and our pie. Something's got to be done with this. Not sure what yet, but this is where, again, it's these three, but if you had to pull out of the two, the big 800-pound gorilla is Medicare and Medicaid. And of that, really, it is Medicare. So again, we know people are getting older. We can see it. We can see what's going on. Basically, the share of the population is aging. So fortunately, people like us will live longer. Uh, I like that. Uh, but as a share of the total population, the baby boomers are now retiring. And they're going to take up more and more resources that are be pulling from something else. So again, as they start going into Medicare, they start going into Social Security, they're going to drain those resources that could be going for discretionary. If we don't do something about it, it's going to increase rapidly. So people start asking, well, what are the factors that go into these cost increases? So there's basically some spending that happens automatically. Basically, you have inflation. So we know what happens with that. So you can see, we can basically say that you know, roughly at the 10% range, we can explain by going to absence of aging and excess growth, 
but here's where aging happens. And here are some things that are excess costs, which we really sort of see why are we getting these increase in healthcare expenses that are above and beyond inflation. Here's a component of it. So you see by 2035, that's going to increase dramatically as well. But we also have to take care of the fact that people are getting older and start going on those retirement rolls. So debt burden. And again, this sort of came out this morning. Um, the debt now is at $14 trillion. Our deficit is going to be estimated $1.5 trillion this year. These numbers, by the way, are what's called debt held by the public, which means it does not include Social Security trust funds. So when we extended the Bush era tax cuts, right now we're roughly about 63 67%. Somewhere in that range is debt held by the public. If you add it and talk about gross debt, you're talking about 93% of GDP is gross debt. And the CBO forecast this morning, I had a chance to go through them, but my guess is we're going to get close to 100% of GDP is gross debt. So that includes all government inter fund transactions like Social Security trust funds. But CBO always focuses on debt held by the public because that's what they go out to and go to the financial markets for to borrow, whether it's individuals like us, whether it's China, whether it's um, corporations who borrow treasury bills. This is debt held by the public, but you can see it's going up and it's increasing rapidly. So CBO also does something called alternative scenarios. So we talked about the idea of, you know, two weeks ago we talked about the doc fix and how Congress basically has current law projections and current law, but they don't always follow through with it and they change it. So CBO is forced to follow basically current law. They do a baseline where they say we're going to assume a certain inflation rate or certain growth of programs. This is their debt under the extended baseline scenario. <clears throat> Excuse me, but then they say, what happens if Congress sort of does in the future what they've done in the past? If history is a good example of the future, you get an alternate fiscal scenario where all of a sudden your debt, and again, this is debt held by the public, basically goes up to above 200% in 2030. This is Greece, this is Japan. And we get there pretty quick. So the idea is can we turn something around before we get into a fiscal crisis, which we can see is coming? Then you get to the thing about debt held by the public again. Just to give you an idea, uh, the right-hand scale is the share of GDP that's debt held by the public. The left is the percent of GDP going for interest. Um, so this is your, um, I believe this is your, it, your, yeah, this one is your interest rate component over here. This one's your debt held by the public. And you can see how it's basically going up. And again, in some ways it flatlines, but it's still too much as a share of GDP. And we think the interest rates, again, are going to climb back up. There's going to be a larger share of GDP going forward. So again, the idea is we've been basing a lot of these interest rates on inflation. Well, how does inflation look? So the, the gray shades are what happens during times of recessions. There's core inflation overall. But this is a change from year to year from 1980. This is the actual 2010. And then here's some forecasts going forward. So you can see sort of the spikes we've had in some inflationary rates because of gasoline prices. But again, the trend line. They're still, CBO is estimating, a relatively small change in inflation every year, roughly 2%. That's sort of normal. If we have any sort of uh, inflationary environment with all the money that's been printed recently to, to finance TARP and other things, this might spike up. That spikes up, it raises our interest costs. More interest goes to in mandatory payments. That's less they can go for discretionary. Again, we're back to a, another budget issue as well. Unemployment rate. So one of the things we talked about and showed was the fact that the non-mandatory um, spending that's not going for Medicare, <coughs> Medicaid, and Social Security is going up, including unemployment insurance. So here is the unemployment rate from 1980 to the present with some forecasts. Now again, you can see we spiked up during the recession. We're right now about 9.4%. My guess is in reality we're still probably near 9.8. There were some people that came off the job rolls in December. They didn't want to look for jobs during Christmas. So they came off and they're probably going to go back on this month. So say we're still around the 9.5 range, 9.4 to 10 somewhere. But the forecast is for it to come back down to 6, somewhere around 2014. Now again, what if we're in a new normal? What if jobs are going to be you know, coming back, but very, very slowly? What if instead of 6%, we hover somewhere around 7 or 8? That then increases again the, not, the other spend that goes for unemployment insurance and everything else and those demands on those resources. This also goes into... Uh, other sort of components when you think about the idea of an economy recovering. If we have a jobless recovery or a slow job recovery, uh, that goes into the forecast about when revenues are going to come back online and growth expectations as well. But this is what's baked in the cake right now. 
The other thing is people have lost their job as a percent of all unemployed. But I kind of want to show just sort of quickly, this is those who've lost their job permanently or, uh, or completed a temporary job. This one is they were temporarily laid off. You can see the recessionary periods from 1980 forward. We had a giant spike in those that lost jobs permanently. The question is, is that going to come back down? Um, this gets in the idea of whether or not we've had a shift in the economy with jobs in general. Are we still moving more towards more significant skill-oriented jobs? What do we do for those folks who really were getting to the baby boom retirement age, were somewhere around 57, 58, lost the job and now can't get back in? What does that mean for the entitlement program with disability, social security payments, and Medicare? Um, so this is something we still have to watch. We're not sure what's still going to happen here. Are those folks going to get reemployed or not? But this is a big, look at the slope of that curve and how quickly it happened. This also explains why some of the payments we've made for unemployment insurance skyrocketed because people lost their jobs very rapidly. So the other thing I want to talk about is, well, what do we do? All right, so we've got the idea. There's the big three. We need Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security reform. We've got to do something. We can still do some discretionary as well, but what really can eat into getting down our deficit? So I love this graphic. It's from the New York Times. It was a couple months ago, but I wanted to highlight it. <clears throat> it basically says, what would remain from the deficit if you did the following steps? One of the perennial favorites of the Republicans, let's go to the National Endowment for the Arts. Waste the money. So you can see it takes out, well, maybe you can't see. It's a little sliver right there. You don't get very far. All right, well, let's keep going. Let's, let's disallow earmarks. Earmarks are a big thing. They're very, the public doesn't like them. It looks like it's fiscally responsible. Let's get rid of all earmarks. What will that do? Now you can see a little sliver. But this is all still remaining. And again, this is a deficit back then of $1.2 trillion. It's now 1.5, so we still got to get further. Well, you can see the idea. Now you go through eliminate welfare payments, cutting foreign aid. Very popular among some people. Doesn't get you far. Shut down the Department of Education. Forget it. We don't need it. Well, doesn't get you far either. Allow the Bush, cuts, Bush tax cuts to expire for the rich. That doesn't do much either, actually. Um, and again, it depends what you consider who's rich. Uh, withhold money for war operations, stop the Recovery Act funds that weren't spent at this point in time in the graph, um, stop Medicaid benefits for poor patients and nursing homes. You see the idea, double corporate tax. Again, those greedy corporations, let's double their taxes. Doesn't get you much. Stop Medicare benefits, cut all domestic other than entitlements. Doesn't get you far. Stop Social Security checks for the retirees. This is now a little higher, but still $730 billion doesn't get you far. Cut all national security spending, 846. You still got... <coughs> excuse me, 421 billion to go. So you can see the idea, these aren't things we're going to solve overnight. I think that's the other problem we're having on Capitol Hill and also conveying to the public, is that we didn't get into this fiscal problem overnight. We're not going to solve it overnight. And I think one of the things that's easy, sort of easier to sell and easier to explain to people is if we go on a 10-year plan, what if we start reducing things maybe across the board, where we take a, a smarter approach, say where is some waste, where can we retard or slow the growth of spending and some entitlements, where do we get ourselves in 10 years? That seems like a more responsible way to get things going than it is to say, well, let's just cut everything at once and you still don't even balance the budget. So again, there are some tough choices to make, but the idea that you can just do this overnight, whether by a tax increase or by spending cuts, isn't very likely. This is going to be a long-term thing that's going to draw out between three and five years at the fast end, more likely five to 10. So the other thing I'd like to show too, because people say, well, all right, Jason, you've just showed on the tax cut, or sorry, on the spending side, show us about taxes. Well, I always say, who do you want to tax? If you're going to raise a tax, someone's got to pay for it. Again, you want to tax corporations, you're still paying for it, whether it's higher prices, lower wages, or something. So who's paying it now? So this is IRS data, and only, the recent one is 2006. They'll so come out with 2007, probably in the fall. So right now, the top 1%, and this is just federal income taxes, the top 1% is paying 40% of all federal income taxes. The bottom half is paying less than three. So this is what they call tax return data. So it can include married couples filing jointly or single filers, but they take all the tax returns, about 150 million are filed a year, rank them low to high, take the middle value, and that's where you get your percentiles. So if you wanted to raise taxes in the top 1%, they're already paying 40%. How much more of the burden do you want to give them? So their question is, who are these people? So what are they making? So the next slide shows you, well, to be in the top 1%, you need an adjusted gross income of $388,000. To be in the top 10%, though, is $108,000. So again, imagine a married couple filing a joint return, each making $55,000 a year, 110 total. Congratulations, they're now in the top 10%. They're rich. So 
how are we going to tax? Who are we going to tax these people? And I think that's one of the things that sort of gets lost in the debate. The bottom half is making $32,000 a year or less. So where do you shift more of the burden? And, and this is an important thing to note because anytime we talk about the idea of either tax reform or tax increases or tax reductions, in some way, shape, or form, if you're going to reduce taxes, you only do some for those who are paying taxes. A lot of folks in the bottom here are getting refundable credits, whether it's the child tax credit or the earned income tax credit. So if they're paying very little to begin with, how do you give them a tax cut they're not paying taxes? So and one of the problems we have too in the debate, if we want to increase taxes, say somebody here is only paying right now nothing. They're getting a refund. Uh, or they're getting a refundable credit, excuse me. And we say we're going to get rid of all refundable credits. Then you have the advocacy groups going to the left. You just raise taxes by 100% for those in the bottom half of the income distribution. So it's a battle that's hard to wage publicly. And that's why we've been basically getting this distribution where the top 10% are accounting for 70% of all tax payments coming in right now. So one of the things I also want to bring up too is how this sort of looks over time. This is something that was done a few years ago when President Bush had the bipartisan panel to look at tax reform. And they kind of went through and said, where were we in tax year 2000? Where were we in 05? And you can sort of see that even after the Bush tax cuts, the bottom half was paying less than before the Bush tax cuts. And they were paying more after. Now again, this is income shares. This is tax shares, not tax payments. But the idea was the Bush tax cuts were actually very progressive. They actually took a lot of people off the tax rolls. The lower income groups paid less of a share of the total. The upper income groups paid more of a share. Now again, they got a tax cut, so they ended up paying less. But they took on more of the total burden. So again, what do we want to do going forward if we're going to do tax reform? Do we want to keep things what's called distributionally neutral and make sure things sort of stay the same distributionally? Do we want to change this so folks here are maybe paying more and these folks are paying less? How do we do it? So these things come into the sort of the battles on tax reform, which then also plays back into what we do on spending side and budgeting in general. So this is sort of where we've gotten to and how we got to where we are and why sort of the budget fights are going. And I want to end up just with a quick discussion, sort of some observations put in the last two weeks together. Um, and sort of the idea is I've always thought that budget policy on Capitol Hill and the government is backwards. Sort of the opposite of a family. So again, you think about your individuals, you think about yourself, you have a salary, you have an income, you get a paycheck, you have a net. You think, okay, I have this amount of money to spend, I can spend it on rent, a car payment, food, dates, movies, hiking, travel. What you're left with is your savings. The government's sort of the opposite. It says, I want this, I want this, I want a new car, I want a new house, I want this spending, I want this spending, and then they find out they don't have money for it, and they either go borrow it. Now imagine if we could do that and go into our bosses the next day and say, I just did my budget, and I'm $100,000 short, I want to raise. Make it up. So it's backwards. So we're basically not doing this. I mean, we talk about, economists talk about income constraints and budget constraints. The government's the opposite. They don't think about constraints. It's more of, let's just use all the resources and figure out how to find it later. And most of it's either done by borrowing. So we've got to sort of figure out how to live within our means. And I think that's one of the congressional problems we're having is how do we actually spend, how do we set budget caps and stick within our means based on what we're bringing in. Uh, again, entitlements right now are taking up two-thirds of the budget. They're going to get worse. How do we budget when entitlements are basically on autopilot and taking up more and more of the pie that is less discretionary to budget, which means we're going to have even more intense partisan battles in the budget cycles going forward. And I think that's something we have to be cautious of. And that's also, I think, a reason to start really pushing now for budget reform. If you can't do it now, it's just going to be harder down the road and going to be worse. Um, if Congress wants to spend, it will spend. We sort of talked about the idea of PAYGO being second best solutions last time. Um, we talked about emergency spending. Even the Republicans, who are supposed to be very fiscally responsible, named the census an emergency spending. Um, so one thing in the Constitution that happens every 10 years, how can it be an emergency if you know it's coming? But they did that to free up money to spend somewhere else. So again, these are people who are supposed to be fiscally responsible who are still spending money. So there are a lot of gimmicks. There are phase-ins and phase-outs. Again, the Bush tax cuts were designed to phase in and phase out and then end within a 10-year window to fit within a scoring window. Um, those things really aren't responsible ways to budget. But we have these things and, of course, earmarks. So what do we do to sort of control this type of what they call a public choice problem where members seem to want to spend to put money back in their district or to get reelected? How do we get things that are responsible here so we actually can really get budget caps that are enforceable and a budget process that's fiscally balanced. Um, the question comes out two things that I sort of think about. One is, do we need a balanced budget amendment? And by this, I sort of mean constitutional. There's something we actually can do that actually puts in place hard cap that says you cannot spend more than X uh, unless you offset it someplace else, but you can't go over this limit, period. No emergency spending, nothing. Uh, if you have wars, you've got to find a way to pay for it. Whether it's a surcharge or a tax, something, but do we put a constitutional amendment in to basically tie someone's hands so if interest groups come in and lobby, member says, I'm sorry, I can't do it. I love your idea, but you've got to find me the savings somewhere else. 
Nothing I do to help you. The other idea is a two-year budget. So Congress is spending a lot of time now budgeting, but they're also supposed to be doing congressional oversight of agencies and how they spend money, how their programs are interacted. And the less time, the more, sorry, the more time that's spent on budgeting, the less time there is for oversight. And I think a lot of oversight is getting washed under the bridge because they're fighting so much about the budgeting. So a question is, could you do a two-year budget that basically says in the off election year, you have the budget cycle. The election year, you basically focus more on oversight and you can do some true ups. You can basically say, we're gonna do a two year budget and the second year we'll see how programs are going. We can add or cut accordingly. But you don't have to go through the budget resolution again, the total appropriations bills. You basically in a two year cycle, you can basically do more oversight and you don't have to fight every year as if it's an election year going into a budget. And I think that's one of the things that comes up. There's a lot of debate about whether or not we should do this or not. I think it should be part of the discussion. So I think it actually might bring down some of the rhetoric if we can do a two year budget process. I'm not saying it's the end all solution, but it might be something that's on the, on the plate uh, to talk about. So this is actually a very short lecture, but I, that's all I have. Um, but I wanted to basically show you, and I appreciate you guys coming for this today. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to entertain them. Thank you. Yes, sir. First one, what did you mean by second best solutions on PAYGO? Oh, so let me go back to this. One of the ideas about PAYGO is it's supposed to be again, a pay as you go. <clears throat> and the problem we had historically is PAYGO basically excluded so many things from the budget. So in the budget process, taxes are considered mandatory spending. There's two buckets in, in the budget, discretionary and mandatory. Taxes are considered mandatory. So if you wanted to cut taxes under PAYGO, you had to pay for it somewhere else, you couldn't offset it with, with cuts in discretionary spending. You had to offset it in mandatory. And it was designed to basically make it harder for you to cut taxes. Because who wants to cut the Social Security checks or Medicare and Medicaid payment instead of saying, well, I'm going to cut a new aircraft carrier or a jet to pay for tax cuts. So it was, it was second best in that sense. The other thing too is it really wasn't something that was fully paid for. Um, there were problems, you basically had to pay for it in a 10 year window. So let's say you had you know, offsets and you said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a new entitlement program and it'll cost this amount of money for 10 years, but I'm gonna phase it in and the 11th year that spending would double, that was not covered under PAYGO. So again, it was a second best solution because it wasn't primarily covering all the costs and again, the taxes weren't allowed to be offset against discretionary spending. Yes, sir. So it seems like a lot of the problem is just how this stuff is scored and the CBOs, I mean, the CBO can only use what Congress gives them in terms of assumptions. Is there some way to apply, I mean, for example, generally accepted accounting principles to the CBO scoring process, or if not that, some other way to reform the way that the CBO scores bills? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. So CBO, I, I think we want to, I don't want to, CBO is doing their job. So the, the, you want to keep them nonpartisan. You don't want them making political decisions by saying, you know, Congress, we don't believe you. We don't think you're going to do this. But I think they should be encouraged more to do some alternate scenarios that says, here's current law, here's maybe expected, or here's alternate scenario one, two, and three, and spell what those assumptions are. And I think you're right when it comes down to the idea of, fisc of government accountability and, and uh, general accounting principles. We're seeing that that's not even being done in the states right now. So state pension plans are being run assuming they have a, a, um, an 8.5% rate of return instead of a riskless rate of return of 3.5, and they're underfunding their plans. So the same thing should be done in Social Security. We should put all that stuff in the books and say, what is our true liability? Not just in a 75-year horizon of Social Security, what is it in the 76th year, the 77th year? What is the sort of the infinite horizon? And make sure we fund things accordingly. So I think there could be something done that says, it, CBO must at least consider it and give us an alternate scenario so that we can have part of it as part of the public debate. That's a good question. Yes, sir. Has your group done any um, forecasting on the effects of uh, severe austerity measures, uh, notwithstanding, I guess, lawmakers' desire to uh, put them through? You mean as far as what it does for economic growth? or um, gr Yeah, growth and, and just economic well-being. Like if we took uh, these big three gorillas and cut, cut them, you know, in a three-year window as opposed to a 10-year window or a five-year window as opposed to a 15 or 20-year. Yeah, no, we haven't, but we're starting to follow now, of course, Great Britain, France, Greece about the hard austerity measures. We have more what we call casual empiricism. What are the, some of the observations we're seeing? One of the observations is it doesn't look like governments want to act until there's literally a crisis. And by that point, you have to then have austerity measures. So part of the story we're trying to tell at Mercatus is, again, let's take a 10-year horizon, because we don't, we're going to be forced with an overnight horizon. And that's going to be worse. And, and show how those cuts are dramatic. So again, one of the things I've been sort of preaching is that with Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, you don't have to necessarily cut benefits. And again, when I mean cut, I mean, if you're getting 100 a day, you get $99 or less tomorrow. What I'm saying is we can slow the growth of those programs. So if you were gonna get 100 today and then 106 tomorrow, 
maybe you get 105. So you're still keeping up with inflation, but you're not getting that bigger boost. Uh, and I think we can do that with healthcare as well. We need to figure out where money is not being spent yet. Don't spend it uh, and find ways to control costs that way. So people can still say, I'm getting my health care. I'm not getting less than last year, but I'm not being allowed to overutilize health care coverage. Ba back and then forward. We'll go behind you first then. Um, do you have any sense um, how much tax collection challenges are an issue? I mean, it, it seems like enforcing some of our tax policy, I'm thinking more in terms of corporate taxes, is also a challenge for us. Any sense of how much that might offset? So I, I, I used to do what's called transfer pricing, which is helping corporations legally move money to lower tax jurisdictions. So on the individual side, there's what's called the tax gap, a compliance rate. You're, you're looking somewhere in a couple hundred million billion dollars. I mean, you're, if you're lucky, you could probably get 40 out of it in one year, but you're not going to solve the gap that way. On the corporate side, Again, this is not evasion. So there's tax avoidance and tax evasion. Avoidance is legal, evasion's not. They're just avoiding it. And people basically, there's an old economics, uh, economics logic where if you tax something, you get less of it. So your tax integration is they're moving their behavior somewhere else to pay less of it. And even if you double their tax rate, we sort of showed it's not gonna fill the, the, the gap. So in fact, if we start taxing them more, then you're gonna see more capital flight, uh, not less. And so the idea, I think President Obama actually did a good job in this last night in the State of the Union was to say, we have a corporate competitiveness problem because of our tax code. Let's find ways in a bipartisan way to bring that burden down so that corporations stay here and corporate here and want to hire here. Yes? This is a little bit off topic. Do you have an opinion on the proposed state bankruptcy legislation? Oh, uh, isn't that interesting? Well, I, I have an opinion on everything, right? Um, <laughs> I, I, opinion you'll share. So this, this is not like, you know, Mercatus policy or anything like that. I, I think we have to be very careful when looking at the moral hazard problem of state bankruptcy. So just to give you an example, and I've not thought this completely through, but let's say I'm the state of California, and I decide I want to declare bankruptcy. Done. All right, I'm going to rewrite my pension rules, everything else. I'm not going to pay the bondholders. So what do the financial markets do? They're going to charge me more interest going forward. But I'm now California. What do I care? If I can't pay it, I'll just default again. So are you encouraging then more fiscally irresponsible behavior, more state or local spending, because they're just going to default on you from the future? I don't know. Uh, on the flip side, does bankruptcy allow the state to say, we have pension obligations that we can't pay to teachers and other unions, either you make some concessions or we're going into bankruptcy. So by, by having that sort of safety net or allowance to go bankrupt, you give them the negotiating authority to make those deals. That's possible. So that's sort of the, on the one hand and the other, I, I think in general, I sort of lean towards the idea that I don't like to have anyone declare bankruptcy. I think you sort of, there are some people who have to, and you have, we have a reason we have it in the bankruptcy code and the tax code and for everything else. But in general, I would hate to see th the fiscal sovereigns sort of declare bankruptcy, whether it's the federal government, state, or local, if possible. I just think it creates more problems than it solves, but. I guess I look at it as a, a little bit unfortunate. It seems like y'all need bankruptcy and deal with the unions and, and, and have political decisions that and, that, and that's the question. And then you get to the idea of brinkmanship. So if you give them the ability to do so, one, will they do it? So would you actually believe them? So whether it's California, New Jersey, or Illinois, if they said, bingo, you have to reduce your pension obligations, let us reduce it, or we're going bankrupt. What if the union said, fine, we'll go to a bankruptcy court judge and we'll ask that we get placed first on the list of receivership. And then everything else suffers instead. So you, re you reduce basically your public services for trash, water, sewer, fire departments, police, but the union pensions get paid. So you're taking a gamble then in sort of in a receivership or bankruptcy that they're going to get a negotiation and not get first preference. I don't know. So I, again, I'm, I'm with you. This is where we're sort of struggling with the idea of does it, what does it mean to allow state bankruptcy? Um, the other thing that's sort of a third option is receivership. Do you actually put a bankruptcy judge in charge of a locality <coughs> or a state and say, you guys haven't been able to handle it, and they've done this in their cities before. The judge has now unilateral you know, authority to cut payments across the board or rework contracts. That's like a third option. But again, I, I see where you're coming from. I'm just not sure. I don't know how it's going to play out. If I thought I knew for sure what the outcome would be, I'd give you a better answer. But I think we have to play around with what might happen one way or the other and then sort of do a probability risk assessment. And I think I would love to see sort of the governments right now negotiate better and harder and be more fiscally responsible and say, if you don't, we're going to start pursuing that option before we even give them the chance. Yes, sir. Okay, my question was, um, apart from all the spending concerns we have, I've also thought that at some juncture, and it may not be around the corner, we could legitimately have a, a financing problem where the Treasury may have trouble 
selling bonds to, at certain rates that in the, the investment community seems uh, willing to to uh, pay for those bonds. I, I I don't think that's around the corner per se, but at at some point, if if we're talking about some of these entitlements <clears throat> becoming so much of our tax revenue, if I'm an investor, seemingly this is the safest security in the world, but you still have to think that that. Uh, there is a kind of doomsday scenario where it becomes almost impossible for the Treasury to really sell debt anymore. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. And this goes back to the slide which sort of showed the, the 2040 quote unquote estimate where you have net interest being 35%, other mandatory being 47%. Again, if you're, if you're an investor, what do you do? Now, again, 30 years out from now, are we going to see another country step forward and being the place to go for capital reserves? You know, whether it's South Africa, Canada. You know, maybe Canada, they've done a better job with their housing crisis than, than we have. They didn't really have one. Will people start basically borrowing Canadian debt, saying that's more secure, we can get a better risk-adjusted rate of return from Canada than we can from the U.S. because we think the U.S. is going to get closer to 2010 Greece and 2040, and they move their flight somewhere else and we have to pay higher interest rates, which then would just exacerbate the problem. So again, I think that's definitely a concern. I think that's part of the story we tell now to say, if we don't do this today, this problem is coming. And, and again, I think the point is a fiscal train wreck is coming. The question is, at what point are we at it today, and are we, are we seeing the, the crystal ball clearly enough to make the public and the members and the president say, we've got to do something today on it? And I think we're getting close, but I'm not sure we're, we're there yet, but I think we're trying. Yes, sir. How do you see this scenario affecting our politics in the future? I mean, if most of the mandatory programs are going for senior citizens and um, everybody else is getting a piece of that little discretionary bit there, do we get some sort of an intergenerational uh, fiscal political warfare thing going on? I think that's a possibility and something to consider. So, so one of the things that's always, this is being taped so I can't say the word I want to use, but um, if, if you don't vote, you don't have the right to complain about your government. And, and I think one of the things we're seeing is, is while voting in this country tends to be basically still low compared to other countries, seniors vote more than any other demographic age group. So we really need to get folks who are 18, 19, 20, 24, 30 to go out there and exercise their right to vote and then exercise that political opinion in policy debates. Because it is going to be something we're going to see in intergenerational where you start making the, the, the point for every one dollar I spend on a senior, that's nine kids I can't put through school uh, in K through 12 and you start seeing those trade-offs. And I think we're going to start seeing that more and more, or you're going to start seeing people who are, will, will then be working age 24, 25, saying, why is so much of my payroll tax is going to somebody else and I'm not seeing the benefits for it? So I'm not trying to call it intergenerational warfare, but I do think we're going to see some sort of intergenerational play going out where people are saying, why am I paying all this excess tax burden for something else that's down the road that I'm not going to see? So it's a good question. Yes, ma'am. Um, speaking of um, senior citizens, I read that and I'm asking you if this is actually true, that on average, a couple of senior citizens get about three times the amount that they paid into Medicare. They take three times the amount out. But with Social Security, whatever, let's say, I think they had a couple making 90 grand when they retired. When they retire, they receive a little less in Social Security over their lifetime than they put in. Is that true for the averages, or is that just that one couple? So for, for the averages, this is the revenue side, but again, for averages, that's sort of true. And the reason why, and let's just sort of say about this, Social Security generally is designed to be a very progressive system. While the taxes you pay in are regressive, in other words, it, there's an income cap, so those who are above the income cap don't pay anymore, their benefits are also capped. But Social Security gives a larger replacement rate to those who are at lower ends than they do at higher ends. So for those who are, say, making less than $50,000 a year, they are going to get more back from Social Security than they paid in. For those that are higher end, they're going to get a little less. Some might break even. But, but the ideas and the trend lines are that you're basically going to get back close to what you paid in. If you're lower income, you'll get paid more. But again, that's mathematically because we basically cap the benefit formula based on what's being paid in. Now go to Medicare. We don't have a cap on Medicare. It's not like we've said you only can utilize $10,000 a year. Now, so, so that's why you start getting the idea they're going to get $3 back for one they put in. So change the idea to Medicare reform. What, what if, and I'm just throwing this out there, what if we said Medicare now is a block grant to people? I will give every senior citizen $10,000, and they're 65 years old. That's your Medicare payment. You can go buy insurance or something else, but now you've then capped the benefit. And then you can figure out whether the taxes you have coming in are enough to pay for that benefit. We're not doing that. We're putting taxes in that pay X, but we're allowing a benefit that could be 
It's unfunded. We have no idea how high it's going to go. So that's the problem. So yes, on average, that's right. But we need to do something to bring those sort of back in line on the Medicare side, at least. Good question. Thank you. Yes, sir, in the back corner. It's another healthcare-related question on that slide you had about where the growth in healthcare spending is coming from. Um, the spending in the absence of aging and excess cost growth, does that reflect like what would be kind of median healthcare spending for a developed country, or is that still taking into consideration some of the particular inefficiencies that we have, and do you think that healthcare reform will change any of that? Calculus? So it, it, it's just a U.S. based. Um, and I think in some ways, let's we get back to the idea of, well, well some of the reforms that went into the, um, the ACA control system or take advantage of this, the answer is partially, again, this is where you get to current law and what we think are alternate fiscal scenarios. So the current law has a, a, a panel that allows them to make some decisions on funding if Congress lets them. So the question is, will we, we, just like the doc fix, will we basically allow those reforms to happen? History shows we won't. If they do, then the answer is yes. So the problem we have looking at health care is, again, how do we make reform stick when it comes to controlling costs? Because someone's always going to complain they're not getting enough. And so this basically looks at sort of the effects of aging and excess growth. We're trying to control for some of that. The question is, under current law, will we stick with it or not? And that's where the, I guess, the $200 trillion question comes in. Anybody else? Well, again, I thank you for your time and coming, and hopefully you guys don't get stuck in the snow. So thank you so much for your time.